So we'll spend the next few minutes talking about non-coding RNAs. And so I think a lot of the focus of this lecture so far has been on uh, looking at mRNAs and poly -A tailed mRNAs in particular. And so it's worth reminding you that there's a lot of non-coding RNAs out there in the world. So non-coding RNA formally are just RNA molecules that are uh, not translated. And so they perform their function uh, simply as RNA molecules. And uh, there's a large number of people who think that RNA has played a much more central role uh, in information carrying and in uh, activity, uh, molecular activity in the cell than protein-centric uh, people would have you believe. And so uh, I think I also mentioned in the review lecture that at least in the human genome, there's kind of well over 80,000 different non-coding RNAs that have been identified so far. And so here's just a incomplete list of all the different types of uh, non-coding RNAs uh, besides mRNA um, that are encoded in the genome. And so we'll just spend a few minutes talking about uh, just a select few different types of non-coding RNAs. And so the first one that I'll mention are called microRNAs. So microRNAs are uh, generally speaking, uh, when in their mature form, they're around not 22 nucleotides long. Uh, they're single-stranded RNA molecules. And they, in some sense, resemble uh, siRNA that we talked about before. Uh, the main practical difference between microRNAs and siRNAs are that microRNAs are endogenous. And so they're actually encoded in the host genome, uh, whereas siRNA are exogenous. And so microRNAs, uh, at least in humans, they're oftentimes found as a separate gene. And so they're actually encoded as a microRNA gene in the genome. Uh, that said, there are a number of microRNAs that do exist in uh, actually within other genes. And so for example, uh, you can find some microRNAs uh, encoded in the introns of uh, what you could call host genes. And so uh, they're actually transcribed by being essentially spliced out of an immature mRNA uh, molecule and then get basically processed into a pre-microRNA. Uh, that's in contrast to microRNAs produced from a microRNA gene, where essentially a microRNA gene is transcribed into a pre-microRNA. Uh, and that pre-microRNA, interestingly, is also capped at the 5' end and has a poly-A tail, similar mRNA. Uh, but it gets processed by Drosha and Pasha uh, to produce pre-mRNA um, as opposed to getting translated. And so for the most part, uh, you'll, you'll note here also that uh, DICER is used to basically develop uh, pre-microRNA uh, into mature microRNA, uh, similar to siRNA. Um, and from a practical standpoint, uh, microRNA um, function similarly to siRNA in the sense that uh, they are single-stranded RNA molecules which uh, are basically used to identify target mRNAs uh, and then are typically used to shut down expression of those uh, mRNAs. And so microRNAs are particularly interesting and they're fairly well studied in part because uh, they have a lot of pretty well-known uh, roles in gene regulation and development. And so, for example, there's a number of microRNAs in humans uh, that are known to regulate kind of master regulators like NANOG and OCT4, which also happen to be Yamanaka factors, um, which then obviously go on and play a lot of roles in terms of pluripotency and um, play a lot of roles in terms of reprogramming cells into iPSCs and differentiation and so on and so on. And so this slide is really just to say that microRNAs um, really do regulate some key transcription factors in the human genome. And so another class of interesting non-coding RNAs are the link RNAs. And so linked RNAs are basically long non-coding RNAs, are defined as uh, non-coding RNAs that are generally at least 200 bases in length. Um, and what's interesting about linked RNAs is that in general they are there's more of these than protein coding genes in the human genome anyways. Um, they tend to look a lot like mRNAs in the sense that they're transcribed by POL2, uh, 
um, and they, they're found in many different organisms. Um, like mRNAs, they're 5' prime capped and 3' prime polyetailed. Uh, unlike a lot of protein coding genes, they tend to be transcribed at relatively low levels. And they're not particularly well conserved, at least among the mammals. And so, you know, an obvious question then becomes, well, what do these uh, linked RNAs do? And so oftentimes they're involved in surprise, surprise gene regulation. And so they really kind of fine tune gene expression patterns. Um, even though there's tens of thousands of linked RNAs in the human genome, um, surprisingly, not that many of them have been very well characterized, and so a few kind of classic link RNAs uh, include Turk and Exist and Hot Air. Uh, but beyond these kind of very kind of classic link RNAs, uh, most of them are, are fairly poorly characterized. And so another interesting fact about link RNAs is that they can really be found all over the genome. And so um, the majority of them are located in intergenic regions. And by intergenic, I mean intergenic with respect to protein coding genes. Um, but a significantly large portion of them can actually be found within uh, exons and inks, within exons and introns of protein coding genes. And actually, even more surprisingly, they can be found uh, both in the sense and antisense direction in both the introns and the exons. And so they. Um, you know, this kind of classic view of, of protein coding genes as uh, being containing exons and introns, which generally get spliced out, um, where the introns generally don't perform a whole lot of function is, is basically debunked. So in terms of the specific functions that link RNAs carry out, it's important to note that link RNAs have been known to perform functions both within the nucleus as well as within the cytoplasm. Uh, in particular, with respect to the nucleus, uh, link RNAs play a number of different roles. So, for example, they can interact directly with the transcriptional machinery in order to regulate uh, the expression of target genes. Uh, they've also been known to act as decoys. So they can act as decoys in the sense that um, transcription factors, for example, might be able to recognize uh, some of these link RNAs. Uh, RNA binding proteins can also recognize uh, certain link RNAs, uh, which then can cause other changes in gene regulation. Um, more specifically, they can also have complementary binding sites to microRNAs. And so they can essentially soak up microRNAs that would otherwise normally target the mRNA of a specific gene of interest. But in some sense, link RNAs um, can basically soak up expressed microRNA and prevent target genes from being downregulated by those microRNAs. Uh, link RNAs can also act as guides in the sense that, again, through either um, direct recognition of link RNAs by, for example, chromatin modifying enzymes, or through RNA binding proteins that then in turn interact with chromatin modifying enzymes, um, they can then essentially guide certain factors towards uh, target genes of interest. And finally, in a similar way, they can act, they can essentially act as scaffolds. So you can imagine that certain longer non-coding RNAs uh, can have binding sites or recognition sites of multiple proteins um, or transcription factors. And then in doing so, they can bring together multiple factors, which then interact and then in turn regulate gene expression. So I've mentioned previously that some enhancers are transcribed as enhancer RNAs. And so I wanted to point out here that enhancer RNAs uh, are not just kind of byproducts of enhancers being co-located in close proximity to transcriptional machinery, but they sometimes are transcribed in order to perform certain functions related to gene regulation. And so for example, here's an, uh, here's an example of a link RNA uh, encoded by the gene LUNAR1, which when transcribed, uh, actually causes LUNAR1, the transcript, uh, the link RNA transcript, to be brought back into close proximity into a gene in cis, uh, the IGF1R gene. What happens is LUNAR1 basically recruits uh, the mediator complex, uh, which then in turn uh, helps recruit POL2 uh, to the IGF1R IGF locus in order to initiate transcription.
And so in this specific example, the lunar one uh, link RNA actually, uh, in some sense, its expression drives uh, chromosome looping and therefore initiates uh, long distance transcription. So here's another example of one of the ways in which linked RNAs can regulate gene expression. And so pre-tree elements are essentially genetic elements that are recognized by both uh, polycomb, which is a protein complex associated with transcriptional repression, as well as the trithorax group of activating proteins. And so the idea here uh, at this particular vestigial locus in Drosophila is that the downstream pre-tree element actually transcribes two different link RNAs depending on which direction of transcription uh, is occurring. And so when transcription occurs in the forward direction, uh, the corresponding link RNA that gets produced essentially recruits polychrome to the promoter vestigial, uh, which then leads to uh, the addition of some K27 trimethylation marks uh, on neighboring histones and ultimately shuts down expression of vestigial. Whereas on the other hand, uh, if the pre-tree element is transcribed in the reverse direction, then this essentially leads to uh, repression of the methyl transferase activity of polycomb, uh, and also actually kicks out polycomb from uh, the vestigial locus. And this ultimately leads to activation of the vestigial gene. And so the point here is that these pre-tree elements can switch between this kind of repressive and activating epigenetic state uh, just by switching the direction of transcription at the pre-tree locus. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is just another way that uh, linked RNAs can, can regulate gene expression in very complicated ways.